This is my privilege to be here today to say the opening words for this workshop, which is uh, part of High Test 25 years celebration. Uh, this session will focus on High Test 25 year history with cardiac markers and developing diagnostic tools in this uh, area. We will be also describing the morning concepts uh, of acute uh, failure diagnostics. For over 25 years, and uh, I'm very proud to tell that we are like 25 years uh, this year, uh, we were developing reagents for detecting of cardiac biomarkers. Uh, and I think that it is fair to say that we are one of the top suppliers of antibodies and uh, antigens to in vitro diagnostic industry in this area. Uh, for what we uh, are mostly known, this is our troponin I uh, reagents. However, our products for detecting of natriuretic peptides are also starting to be very popular, and we have the complete panel of uh, other cardiac markers. Uh, we have estimated that nearly 300 million patients are annually tested with our antibodies for acute myocardial infarction and about 20 million patients for heart failure. Of course, this is just the estimation, but we really believe that the numbers are close to reality. Uh, our approach to product development has always been based on uh, scientific research. Uh, for during our history, we have published over uh, 40 articles, just uh, two of them during uh, this year. So this is really what uh, differs high test from other supplier of uh, antibodies. We are looking forward to continue our friendship uh, with cardiac markers. Uh, and we are looking forward to the bright future. Uh, but now I would like to invite you for the exciting journey with cardiac markers. And this journey will be led by uh, Professor Fred Apple and Dr. Alexander Simonov. Fred. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, I'm Fred Apple. Uh, for full disclosure, uh, I am on the board of high tests, so just to make that disclosure. So uh, Maria asked me to, and high tests asked me to give a talk about where the state of the art of the 25 years in celebration of their company. So uh, I did take a little different approach. I'm going to spend time telling the history of cardiac biomarkers and how high tests came into the field and where they are today on the cardiac troponin side. So this, I've shown this, uh, this is a really nice cartoon I saw. Uh, in Minneapolis in the healthcare system, and clearly where we have come with troponin assays based on some of the re reagents and antibodies used by high tests in developing high sensitivity assays is we want to be the heart attack comma. We want to be alive when we use these markers in detection of injury. And I, throw, I have to show this up. These are my colleague Jordi Ordandez from uh, Spain, and this is a picture of me from 1982. So we've come a long way. We both here, uh, Jordi has studied natriuretic peptides, which we'll hear about later. So the world has changed from whatever this was, all right? So we're, when I started in this field, uh, when I started studying cardiac markers in 1982, I, I, I drew some blood. This is an old SMA 1260. And what I noticed right away, I had an increased total CK and I had an increased SGOT. And these used to be the markers of detection of heart attack. And I was fortunate to meet over the course of my training. Uh, some of you may know this is Art Carmen. He described the first marker for the detection of heart attack using AST SGOT. And this is Sidney Rosalki. He was the one that first described the use of total creatine kinase uh, for the use of uh, detection of MI. And I corralled them at an AACC meeting way back to get the picture with both of them. So where that came up, we noticed that use of creatine kinase had a lot of in, uh, non-specificity. Everyone has an increase of CK, just like my initial SMA60. What does it mean? So then we moved off to the era of isoenzymes. And this is actually a picture of right here of my isoenzymes. Uh, 
And you can see here my CKMB, which became the new tool in the early 80s, was at 9%. So what does that mean? The, the rule of thumb for those of you who've been around the field for a while, anything greater than 5% is a heart attack. Well, I was admitted as a fellow to the ICU because of my high CK and my increased CKMB. All right, I'll get to that. And as you can see here, as a trick, I put a little piece of dirt on the electrophoretic gel and I got this little heart to show up, just like it would in CKBB. It turned out that it was from skeletal muscle. So we learned that there's a, it was a very nonspecific marker in injury to skeletal muscle that released CKMB. But we moved from an immunoassay type on two sandwich antibodies to, to the world of Jack Ladenson, where he developed the first anti-CK monoclonal antibody against CKMB. This was his fellow, Ham Vaeda, who worked with Jack to develop that monoclonal antibody. The field shifted quickly, and if you look back, we're talking in the, this was in the 80s. And in, uh, in the 90s, in 1995, if anyone was at the meeting in New Orleans, billboards all the way from the airport to the convention center first showed the release of the Baron Germanheim, now Roche anti-cardiac troponin T assay developed by Hugo Cadis. And also Jack Ladenson developed probably the second troponin I assay uh, in his lab with uh, Giza Bodar, Giza Bodar developing the assay. So that, again, this is now in the, in the mid-1960s. It was about this time, 25 years ago, where high tests came into, into, uh, into being. And the role of cardiac troponin, in this case I, a study we did early in 2004, the power of troponin shows on this uh, 1,700 patients, 8.8% of the CKMB back then was a false positive. When you move over to, you see here, just troponin, this is the early assays, troponin positive, CKMB negative, you can see here now we're getting a little more sensitive and it drove clinicians crazy. So where are we today? I don't know if anyone came to my workshop this morning for the IFCC. People are nervous about high sensitivity assays because there's another shift. We went from MB to troponin, now troponin to high sensitivity. It's going to get better with that. You shouldn't be scared of high sensitivity with the antibodies being used because they're going to avoid the noise like we had with CKMB. And the reason this is so powerful, this is one slide from a study. I'm going to show some work from our lab. 1999, this is an ROC curve. It was pretty obvious. Cardiac troponin, in this case, cardiac troponin I, this was the old Dade assay, the Dade Stratus. Uh, very powerful tool to show an improved diagnostics. So now everyone started gathering key opinion leaders, experts around the world. The IFCC, we had a, a, a task force. Uh, Mario Pantagini chaired it. And we gathered in, uh, you can see the chemists gather in a cold winter day in Germany. And this doesn't show up here, but then the cardiologists got involved and they published their first universal definition of myocardial infarction in 1999. The cardiologists, and I was fortunate to be invited as part of the biochemical working group, they meet in Nice, France in July, so they're much smarter than uh, the chemists. But fast forward my relationship with high test. I met Alex Kutruka, who's the head of research in the Moscow uh, research branch, and I met Maria Saravina. Uh, they were part of our IFCC group when we met, and we did have a little conference we met, and you can see here's Maria and here's Alex, and we took a, a, a gondola up to some mountain that's in the southern uh, Germany to have a beer, to talk troponin though, all right? And then currently, as I said, I chair this task, uh, this committee, the Committee of Cardiac Biomarkers, and we've been trying to do educational products since the last several years. And it's a combination of industry and academics and hospital-based uh, people. And it really works when you put industry together. And what our, one of our focuses is to understand what's going on with troponin, especially high sensitivity troponin. So I took this cartoon off of the high test website. And it really kind of sums up their progression and the development and quality production since 1994, 25 years in the MI prognosis, in the MI diagnosis, and in heart failure. And we'll hear later on after my talk about heart failure. So this cartoon shows that uh, no one really knows exactly, I'll show you a slide, what the exact mechanism per individual 
besides when you have a clot in your heart and you get ischemia and you release things. But we learned the more cells that are damaged, the greater the amount of troponin that's leaked from the heart into the circulation. And this could also be a picture of what happens in aging in, elevate, in, uh, in adults. Because some people think with our new technologies, putting into high sensitivity assays, that we're going to start using age-dependent cutoffs one day in the 60s, 70s, and 80s like we see for natriuretic peptides. So this is the first paper. And the one thing about high tests, which is really nice, they have a group of scientists that not only do they make things, quality products, and, and get these into the marketplace to companies, but they also do real science. And this shows you, uh, we find the data on here. This is 1998. Uh, one of the early papers published uh, by the scientific group and what they were showing here is a lot of different antibodies they developed detects multiple different forms of cardiac troponin I in the tissue. When you choose the best antibody that's going to have the most cross-reactivity, they show that up to seven different peptides were detected. These are NC terminal degradations, oxidative sporulation, different forms of I from a three subunit to a single subunit complex. And you can see here, you could actually see a serial kinetic pattern that is released. Move forward, 2018, same director, and now new scientists and old scientists. And now, with improvements of their technologies, you're now seeing the ability, still the same, the same major form of troponin I, which is the IC complex, is the predominant form but now they have technologies to look at many, up to 12 different forms. And now, where the past slide I showed you was looking at changes in the myocardium, it took almost 25 years to get the technology and the ability to detect things in the serum in five representative MI patients extracted from their serum. So we move with a, you can imagine the sensitivity with the antibodies, looking at tissue, which has got a lot of protein, troponin I, now we're looking at it in the blood. So I'm not going to talk about mechanisms, but one of the controversies, and my colleague, I see Alan Wu in the back there, we have a little bit of a debate. He thinks there's reversible injury, and I was raised in believing on the literature that the only time troponin is released from the tissue into the blood is cell death. But the mechanisms out there, there are many mechanisms out there, necrosis, apoptosis, cell wound, necropractosis. It doesn't matter what the injury is, but we have the tools now to measure. We don't really know how many cells have to be injured before we can get a signal. That is still an active investigation. Now, a very recent paste, uh, paper that came out of high test was just published in Clinical Chemistry. And I, I'll show a couple slides here, because I think this is a, a great study that will open doors for people to explore. It revisits the concept of what's the latest evidence of what's released and how can we utilize antibodies to look at different forms of troponin because the goal to put this into clinical patient care is we want to be able to measure any fragment of troponin I to give us a signal that's abnormal. So what, he show, what they described in this paper is here's the, TC, uh, here's the ITC ternary complex. When there's injury, there's C and N terminal degradation to a lower molecular form. There's further degradation, then you have fragments. And what high test has been very successful in doing in the technology they use to develop antibodies, and other people are doing this also, you now can look at the different parts of the protein in the different form, whether it's a full tri ternary or a binary complex, and they're developing antibodies in different regions of the molecule again, to try to find out how you can maximize the detection of the troponin when it circulates. Again, another cartoon taken from the high test catalog. And this is not a full representation of all the assays, but it's many of the assays in the marketplace or what were in the marketplace. And you get somewhat of a conception here that multiple uh, companies are using antibodies based in this region in the 20 to 40 to 50 range of you know, epitopes. It seems to be a, a stable region, and it, it, you get a lot for your dollar, so to speak. And then other people take different approaches. There might be a sandwich of antibody capture, antibody detection with a signal. Or some people now you can see are using, some companies are using three antibodies, maybe two to capture, one to detect, one to capture, two to detect. And one of the things I thought was really clever uh, that high tests put forth 
and I'll just you know simplistically put at this is that remember I talk about the majority of troponin I circulates as an IC complex. So they've shown some work that you maybe could increase your yield of capture of troponin I if you build in an anti-C antibody along with an anti-cardiac troponin I antibody. Cardiac troponin T is not cardiac specific. It's found in both heart and skeletal muscle. But if you're using an anti-cardiac troponin I heart form antibody and it, it, you tag it with along with a, in, the, in your schematic have a company puts together, you may be able to increase your yield of capture because sometimes the way the protein folds, you sometimes can't get at certain regions. So I thought it was a very clever idea. The other thing that uh, I've been, I actually personally have been involved with, uh, with some groups in the animal uh, pharmaceutical uh, companies, is when you go to do drug development and you want to check for safety, there are animal models initially used before they put a drug into human testing, you know, phase one. And high test has gotten into very carefully looking at different laboratory animals and looking at the heterogeneity and homogeneity of what troponin I and maybe troponin T, and they've developed different antibodies that have different cross reactivities shown by Western blot. So it's, I'll tell an interesting story. I, did, I once did some safety work for a company, and they said in the first phase of the development of their drug, they showed no signal of troponin I, all right? And they were using an assay called DPC. Everyone remember DPC? It's now part of uh, Siemens, all right? When it went to human trials, it turns out the human trials with this drug, the laboratory doing the analysis started using an Abbott assay. Well, the Abbott assay had cross-reactivity with that animal model. The DPC didn't detect that animal model. So all of a sudden, they were seeing signals. So it's important that you know what you're measuring. Otherwise, you can imagine that drug didn't make it because of all the cardiac toxicity was going on. So this is another really nice field that they've looked at. So, this slide I've shown in other talks, we've come a long way. We now have many assays that are cleared throughout the world, and now more and more are starting to get approved in the United States. And what's the impact of these assays? First, the new technologies with the antibody production, they can look at where these, as I showed you earlier, and they can get around any interferences if you pick the right antibodies. So maybe you avoid heterophile antibodies, maybe you avoid where there's some kind of hemolysis or autoantibodies. So I think the technology can be essentially modeled to allow you to do uh, a crafted way to look at capture and detection antibodies to avoid these known interferences. The other thing that has been described by now seven different authors in neuromuscular disease, uh, there is some concern that there may be for troponin T cross-reactivity with the cardiac troponin T current assay in the marketplace. High test is actually working on anti-cardiac troponin T antibodies. I'm not sure exactly when the IP goes off for Roche, but the uh, early work appears to show that their antibodies essentially uh, don't pick up these same cross-reactivities as shown as this, uh, in this Austrian study that showed false positives for cardiac T without any cardiac involvement where the troponin I was normal. As far as interferences, uh, I have to put a plug in for my committee. Uh, we have a, a table that shows uh, all the interferences as put out by the manufacturers, whether it's hemolysis, whether it's hemoglobin, well, it's skeletal muscle, as well as a list of all of the uh, antibodies used in all of the assays. And I, uh, we're going to start, I have a, a postdoc that's going to start uh, not only looking at all these assays for high sensitivity, but we're going to try to figure out which manufacturers and what epitopes are used for every company and we're going to put a label on, this one's by high test, this one's by Siemens, and we're going to try to figure out which antibodies are in each assay. So what are the impacts of all these, uh, what are the impact of all these assays? Improve analytics, improve lab practices, better for patient care, earlier detection of myocardial injury, that's a good thing. It's not something to worry about, you're going to pick up more injury because it's a bad sign if you have an increased troponin. Early rule out, early rule in within two to three hours, depending on your algorithm. You don't have to wait six to 12 to 24 hours anymore. And the risk is very impressive where we detect things even within the reference range. So uh, I'm not gonna spend time on the universal definition. I've kind of alluded to that. But what we're doing now is 
We're now starting to pick up examples of myocardial injury, which would have been noise before. And this is, raises flags, because if you look at the risk stratification studies, all of these entities portend some long-term risk. So I'll show you, uh, let me show one slide here. And this is uh, going to be the future. So I'm a believer that one day when you bring your children to the doctor before they go to camp for the summer, instead of getting, just getting a cholesterol, I think they're going to baseline your child with the high sensitivity assay. And why? Because if you look at this early study we did in about a 2,000 patient data set, there's incredible risk just looking within the reference range. You can see here, if I can put my glasses on, all right, you can see see here that there's a fourfold difference in risk depending on where your value is, and here's for men. Fortunately, as a 66-year-old, I'm okay still based on the Abbott assay. I'm, I'm not have to worry about my risk. Uh, we define assays by the ability to high sensitivity. It's an analytic scorecard we've put into place and recommended not only by the IFCC and the AACC Academy, but also the universal definition recognize this that using the LOD by the manufacturer, what percent of men and women have to be measurable but at least 50% of a normal? Implementing these tests will be, I think, can be challenging, but it's not to be afraid of. It's not a mess. The field is full of good literature. You have to know your assay. But I point out one of the concerns is the troponin T assay by Roche, it's a good assay, but when you get rid of their Gen 4 assay, which is not a great assay, there is a huge increase in the detection of how many increases. While with troponin I assays, most of the contemporary assays are pretty good assays. Switching to T, actually the detection rate goes down because you avoid the noise. So I talked about this at my talk this morning. We've come up with these guidelines that you should look at this paper. It helps you when you implement assays to how to look about both analytics and how it'll impact patient care. As far as point of care assays, uh, we're still waiting for that real, maybe small pocket size analyzer that'll have, or a, bit, a little small benchtop analyzer that'll have a high sensitivity assay. The antibodies are out there, and I think it's, hopefully we'll see in the next year or two, a point of care assay that will be a true high sensitivity. So my final two slides, what I have learned from high test in my time before I joined as a board of director, as well as uh, my current here position. The history of their manufacturing of quality and antibodies is as good as any manufacturer out there. It's based on good analytical clinical studies of the antigen that's found in patients' blood, and therefore they, they have an unmet, an unmet need to move forward in what they do. As uh, they're their standard materials were used by the NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, as the standard reference material 2129 when there was AACC groups to help harmonize and get traceability for all assays. The now introducing recombinant antibodies and different animal models to improve the affinity of their antibodies to, again, eliminate noise and to pick up more signal. And I think you're going to see also uh, when other companies start maybe looking at troponin T assays, they're going to have a quality product, hopefully without any skeletal muscle immunoreactivity. And in our next speaker, we're going to hear really the state of the art of where the company has taken as, as far as the natriuretic peptides. So I leave you uh, with two last slides, I think. This is a picture of uh, Moscow, Russia. This is the research team head, headed by the only guy without a white lab coat on. Uh, they let you in the room, Alex? Where are you? Okay. He's got a blue sport coat on today, so he looks much better. <laughs> and finally, uh, uh, this is a picture. I was fortunate enough to study troponin when I, uh, in January and February. This is a picture from the town of La Scala in the in, uh, coast of Brava in Spain. So this is where I like to sit at night and think about cardiac troponin. Not really, but at least I got to think once in a while. So uh, I leave time for about five minutes of questions, if there's any questions. Thank you very much for listening to me. Hi, I'm Kristin Eikre from uh, Bergen, Norway. Uh, I wonder, what do you think would be the clinical impact of measuring troponin fragments, different fragments? What can it be used for? So her question had to do with the impact of fragments. 
two potential things. One, any troponin release that fragments, we want to be able to measure that the total troponin in the circulation. So it increases the signal to intensity. So easier to maybe get a signal on a small infarct that has fragments. Make sense? The second part is, there, uh, Jennifer Van Eyck, who's a, who's a chemist who's now in the field, she started to say, boy, if we can look at a sequence of timing of the kinetics of troponin, maybe I can backtrack the time to figure out when the actual event occurred. So if I see one fragment now, boy, that's within an hour of an infarct. If I see six fragments, maybe that's three hours. So the thought was we could do timing over that. And that would be a powerful thing if you could come in the emergency room. I could get a 20-minute assay that showed me there was nine fragments in the pattern. The doctor could say, I know how to treat now based on when the infarction occurred. Just a thought. Hi, right, Chris Maya from MBio. Uh, actually, threading on that, that suggests that you there's actually a role for a multiplex test, something that could look at a couple of different, like different fragments or or so forth. What do you see as a desired um, kind of multi um, marker type, you know, collection of uh, troponin uh, uh, pieces or, or 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 you know, what's the role of my multiplexing in that? I, I love the idea. We've actually tossed that around for years. If you could come up with a series of assays that could recognize different fragments and put them onto a microtiter plate, and you could actually get a pattern of signals that define what you'd expect. Remember I showed the slide of one to 11 fragments, and you saw the dec you could and you could do some timing. I think that would be a very powerful tool. The key would be to, to prove that it's going to work. So. Uh, Different antibodies might get different signals, but I think it's a great PhD thesis, to be honest. <laughs> if you have a multiplex instrument you want to work together, we can talk. <laughs> Thank you. Good question. All right, so uh, Maria, do you want to introduce the next speaker? Or? Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. My name is Alexander Semenov, and I'm a project manager in HITEST. First of all, it's a great, great honor for me to speak right after Professor Apple. It doesn't happen often, and honestly, it's the first time <laughs> for me. So, and in my uh, today's uh, talk, I will focus uh, mostly on natriuretic peptides, and especially on the impact of uh, HITEST, uh, which we managed to bring to the field. So, uh, first of all, I will present uh, the heroes. Uh, uh, natriuretic peptides belong to a family of uh, natriuretic, uh, natriuretic peptide family, and there are three members, uh, ANP, BNP, and CNP. And also, there are several of them. Only one uh, was chosen by clinical, uh, clinical society. And, uh, of course, there are some reasons for this. Uh, BNP has greater in vitro stability and uh, uh, superior diagnostic performance in comparison with other members. However, I am a bit sad that ANP and CNP were uh, neglected. So I think they still have some potential uh, in future. Uh, Natriuretic peptides are produced by heart in response to volume and or pressure uh, overload. They are released in circulation and they act uh, to uh, promote vasodilation to increase natriuresis and diuresis, and uh, as an end uh, effect, they reduce blood pressure. Uh, as the production and uh, release in circulation uh, increases uh, in relation to cardiac abnormalities, uh, it's obvious that th they are really good uh, biochemical markers of of uh, heart failure, and nowadays they are considered as uh, golden, golden biomarkers of heart failure. Like many other physiologically active peptides, uh, BNP uh, is, pre is uh, produced as uh, uh, precursor 
Proform pro BNP, which has to be cleaved to give rise to active active BNP and inactive uh, and terminal counterpart anti pro BNP. And nowadays, when we are saying natriuretic peptides, we uh, mostly we mean uh, BNP and anti pro BNP. This is a very simplified scheme of pro BNP processing, and I ask you uh, to delete this file from your minds because it has nothing to do with the reality. This is a bit uh, more realistic scheme of uh, ProBNP processing, and as you can see, ProBNP undergoes post-translational modifications, and th this is uh, glycosylation, and also at this scheme you see the role of uh, glycosylation of 30971 residue. If this residue is glycosylated, ProBNP cannot be processed, and uh, is released in circulation in un unprocessed form, and in case it's uh, sorry for this. Uh, ProBNP can be processed and to give rise BNP and the one one uh, anti ProBNP. And uh, also we should keep in mind that there are uh, multiple uh, truncated forms of both uh, BNP, anti ProBNP, and ProBNP. And we are indeed uh, privileged that we managed to to add uh, several pieces to this very complex uh, picture. However, uh, we have to admit that some pieces of this uh, puzzle are still missing. Uh, obviously, uh, high complexity of BNP-related peptides uh, generates a lot of challenges for immunoassay development. And in my today's talk, I am going to speak a bit about uh, some of them. So I will uh, touch these four topics, and I will start uh, with uh, the influence of glycosylation on anti-proBNP immunoassays. Anti-proBNP uh, actually represents very well, uh, let's say, high-test research uh, philosophy. So when uh, we start a research project, first of all, we start with developing of a variety of antibodies. And in case of antiprobin P, uh, since 2002, HITES developed a great number of antiprobin P specific an uh, antibodies. In HITES, we do not develop immunoassays, we develop tools which can be used by IVD companies uh, to create uh, reliable immunoassays. So, uh, here you, you see that uh, we developed uh, antibodies specific to different parts of anti -pro BNP molecule, and uh, then we use them as a highly specific, highly specific uh, and uh, sensitive tool to study immunochemical properties of anti -pro BNP. And at this, this slide, you see immunochemical uh, immuno activity of endogenous pro-BNP in comparison to pro-BNP. And uh, it, you can see that central region of both molecules is inaccessible for antibodies. And this is because of uh, glycosylation, uh, which prevents antibodies from binding to this region. And uh, in, uh, in blue, this is anti-pro-BNP, and C-terminal part is free of uh, glycans, and they, this region can be accessible for antibodies. However, in case of pro-BNP, it's uh, also inaccessible. And uh, this is again 30971 residue, which I mentioned uh, before. Uh, nowadays, it's well known that anti-provin P is uh, all glycosylated, and at this slide, you can see Western blotting uh, of uh, anti-provin P extracted from six different plasma samples uh, with different levels of anti-provin P. And you can clearly see that anti-provin P is uh, different, even if we compare six, uh, six patients. Uh, so, and it migrates, uh, uh, migrates uh, higher than recombinant anti -pro BNP produced in E. coli, which is not modified by glycosidic residues. Uh, nowadays, uh, the most popular commercial anti -pro BNP SA is produced by Roche, and uh, at this slide, it's a schematic representation of antibody, antibody combinations used in this assay, and you can see that one of the antibodies is specific to partially glycosylated region of anti-pro-BNP, and uh, consequently, this assay 
can measure only a subfraction of antipro BNP and not a total antipro BNP. Uh, and if we use another combination of antibodies, for example, uh, to C terminal part and N terminal part of antipro BNP, with this approach, we can detect total antipro BNP and also if both antibodies are specific to N terminal part. As uh, schematically presented at this slide. So such assays can measure total antipro BNP and not a subfraction. Uh, we compared the absolute values which can be measured by uh, total antipro BNP assay and by Roche antipro BNP assay. And you can see that difference uh, in some samples can be up to tenfold. And again, I would like to highlight this. The difference is not constant. In some samples, the difference is two or threefold, and in some samples, it can reach up to 10 or 20 fold. So again, uh, this is uh, very heterogeneous. So, just uh, uh, as a conclusion, the different antipro BNP assays measure different antipro BNP, and this is because of glycosylation of antipro BNP. And if we uh, come to clinical value and if we compare uh, our prototype antipro BNP assays with commercially available Roche antipro BNP assay, we see that uh, e diagnostic accuracy is at least. Uh, similar, so it's uh, more or less the same for uh, total antipro BNP and for uh, a subfraction non glycosylated at uh, the region 42-46 antipro uh, BNP. Uh, so uh, we can say that at least similar clinical value for both assays. Uh, however, we suppose that total antipro BNP can be advantageous for heart failure diagnostics or therapy monitoring, for example, for patients under the treatment with Entresto. I will come to this topic a bit later uh, in some groups of patients or disease states. Uh, now I would like to talk a bit about standard, uh, standardization of antipro BNP measurements. So again, uh, here uh, we can see how endogenous antipro BNP and pro BNP uh, look like being analyzed by uh, SDS page. And uh, you see how uh, diffuse they migrate, so how heterogeneous they are. And uh, oh, uh, so they uh, are really very diff different, like these uh, two guys. So they're as similar as, as those. And uh, obviously, it's uh, unlikely to prepare a glycoprotein standard for antipro BNP assays that is uh, identical to the endogenous circulating form of a biomarker. Uh, however, we would like uh, to suggest a solution. Uh, so non-glycosylated antipro BNP still can be used as a calibrator for any type of antipro BNP assays. So for Roche-like antipro BNP assay, we'll definitely recognize this kind of calibrator. And uh, any other uh, antipro BNP assay can also be calibrated with uh, non-glycosylated recombinant antipro BNP. And uh, we will get, uh, let's say, true values for assays based on antibodies targeting non-glycosylated regions and, uh, of course, underestimated levels for assays based on antibodies targeting partially glycosylated regions of antibody BNP. That's, that's pretty obvious. Uh, and I'm really uh, glad uh, to announce that uh, now we have a high test, have a collaboration on antipro BNP standardization with the uh, National Institute of Metrology, and we provided uh, our recombinant antipro BNP to the institute, and they are now working on reference material uh, for antipro BNP immunoassays. Now I would like to talk about uh, standardization of BNP measurements. And if we come uh, to BNP from antipro BNP, again, I have to say that it's a very, very challenging analyte uh, because different truncated forms are present in circulation and obviously truncation of BNP affects its immunodetection. There are several known cleavage sites uh, in a BNP molecule. And, uh, <laughs> If we compare so-called clinical BNP with uh, BNP-132, uh, again, uh, we have to say that 
BNP-132 almost does not exist because, as you can see from this slide, uh, the difference in absolute values can reach up to 20 or even higher. So it means that uh, BNP-132 in some uh, patients uh, is uh, present either in very low concentrations or is not present at all. And uh, of course, when talking about BNP, we should keep in mind that clinical BNP, it's a mixture of different forms, including proform, like uh, is presented at this slide. So what we measure uh, by means of immunoassays, it's a mixture of truncated BNP and uh, major BNP immunoreactive form is pro-BNP which is glycosylated. There are a number of commercially available BNP immunoassays, and again, it's my privilege to mention that one of these assays is based on uh, technology developed by HITEST. Uh, so uh, that is so-called uh, single epitope uh, BNP immunoassay, which requires only one epitope uh, within the stable uh, ring part of the molecule. And as you can see, uh, commercially available immunoassays are based on ep uh, antibodies which uh, target different epitopes. N now we know that there is a large between method variability for most popular BNP immunoassays, and difference can be more than twofold. So this difference uh, do really matter. Uh, what are the reasons for, for large differences? Of course, different antibodies, so different cross-reactivity to BNP, pro-BNP, and their fragments, and uh, still there is lack of a common calibrator for, to be used by manufacturers. Every manufacturer is currently using its own calibrator. If we are thinking about uh, standardization of BNP immunoassays, we should keep in mind that with such diversity of uh, antibodies used in uh, commercially available assays and also uh, the fact that uh, clinical BNP cannot be clearly defined, uh, we should rather think about harmonization than standardization of BNP immunoassays. And uh, as a solution, uh, high tests suggest using ProForm, ProBNP, as a calibrator for BNP immunoassay. This form is a major form. And we tested this idea by uh, comparing synthetic BNP, synth uh, recombinant produced in E. coli, ProBNP, and recombinant glycosylated ProBNP produced in mammalian cells. And we found out that, uh, indeed, if we are using glycosylated pro-BNP, we can uh, reduce up to twofold in mean between a safe variation. So actually, it's pretty good, good result. Yeah, this, the results were published in paper in uh, Clinical Biochemistry Journal. So this was done in collaboration with uh, Fred Apple's lab, and we do appreciate this a lot. So, uh, recombinant glycosylated pro-BNP produced in eukaryotic cells, if it's used as a common calibrator, can help to reduce between, say, variability. And uh, now the last topic I would like to address in my talk is uh, BNP testing and Entresto. So the introduction of Entresto by Navartis in 2014 generated a number of questions, number of new challenges for using natriuretic peptides in patients under treatment with Entresto. Uh, here, just an illustration how Entresto works. It has two components. One of them is inhibitor of neprilysin enzyme, which is responsible for the cleavage of uh, natriuretic peptides. And the second component is Valsartan, which inhibits uh, angiotensin receptor. So since uh, Entresto inhibits neprilysin and neprilysin cleaves nitrate peptides, one can expect that it, it will influence, uh, influence uh, measurements of uh, nitrate peptides. And also, one may expect that uh, since Entresto inhibits neprilysin, it should be more, ef more efficient in patients with high activity of this enzyme and maybe less efficient in patients with low activity of enzyme. Uh, at this slide, uh, you see a 
representation of the uh, idea of active nitrogen type pool. So there is an uh, incoming tube um, which uh, has uh, which has two valves, uh, re regulatory valves. Uh, yeah, this is expression and uh, efficiency of uh, pro processing and the number of outcoming tubes. One of them is uh, neutralizing, degrading nitrogenic peptides. And Entresto acts only on, on this tube. And if we are thinking about evaluations of, of the efficiency of Entresto, we, we should think about uh, the level of active nitrogenic peptide and uh, the activity of neutralizing. So it would be really great to have a biomarker which uh, will uh, indicate uh, indicate uh, the effect of interest on the uh, amount of uh, active nitrogenic peptide. That's what we tested uh, in our recent studies. Uh, you can see that uh, neprilysin cleaves active BNP, and it gives uh, the cleavage gives rise to uh, opening of the ring structure. And this form we call BNP ne neo 17 because this uh, neo epitope uh, comprises. Uh, residue, uh, the 17th residue. So our idea was uh, to test if this form indeed is uh, generated by neprilysin and if we can detect this form in heart failure patients. First, uh, in, vitro, in vitro we confirmed that uh, NEO17 is produced by neprilysin and is inhibited with a neprilysin uh, inhibitor secubitril. And then we confirmed in red model that uh, this form is generated uh, in circulation. So uh, for measurements, we use uh, novel immunoassay, BNP neo 17 immunoassay based on polyclonal antibodies targeting this uh, uh, new epitope 17 and uh, our uh, BNP antibody 50E1. By using this immunoassay, we showed that BNP neo 17 form is indeed present in, uh, in circulation of heart failure patients, and the uh, ratio of this form to total BNP form is different. That's what we uh, wanted to, to confirm first. So, uh, uh, this BNP neo form is present in the circulation and the percentage of this form to total BNP form varies among individuals independently on total BNP or in TPRO BNP levels. And our hypothesis is that in case the level of this form is high, we can uh, consider that uh, in this patient uh, there is high uh, activity of neprilysin and high amount of active BNP. So we may expect high efficiency of treatment with uh, uh, Entresto or any other neprilysin inhibitor. And in case uh, the level of this form is low, we might expect low efficiency of treatment with neprilysin inhibitor. So coming back to uh, the title of the talk, uh, from basic research towards reliable immunoassays, uh, I hope that during my today's talk I managed to demonstrate, to convince you a bit that it's really important to, uh, to perform, to be consistent in uh, doing this basic research of uh, cardiac biomarkers illustrated by natriuretic peptides uh, in order to, to develop reliable immunoassays. And uh, I uh, have to, I should, should admit that there has been great, great improvement in our understanding of the diversity of circulating forms. Uh, and this is all due to in-depth biochemical investigations. And uh, as a result, novel assays and improved comprehension of the clinical meaning of test results uh, we have now. Uh, of course, a number of new challenges should be addressed in future studies to improve the diagnostics and treatment of heart failure. And uh, this is my message, uh, optimistic message that we should never say no <laughs> to science. Uh, now it's uh, my great, great honor to show this picture. This is R&D team of HITEST, uh, Alexei Katruha, the director. So this is our uh, uh, total uh, R&D team and some people involved, uh, people involved in the studies. Uh, Karina Seferan, Natalia Tam, uh, me and uh, Evgenia uh, still working on natriuretic peptides and others working on 
uh, other cardiac biomarkers. And uh, this is uh, the picture from the celebration of the 25th anniversary we had this, summer, uh, this spring in uh, Finland, uh, Heiko. And you can see uh, all the people of HITEST and uh, gain my great privilege uh, to show you this as our, the highest value of the company. So I appreciate a lot you listening to me today and thank you for your attention.